Ready. And a uh, very good uh, evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Paul, NO0T, and this is the Front Range Six Meter Group uh, Zoom meeting. And tonight we're very fortunate to have Hassan uh, N0AN, who's going to be uh, giving us a great presentation on optimizing digital receiver performance using SDRs and SDR console software. So with that, I'm going to hand the uh, hand the mic over to uh, Hassan, and I'll let you start uh, sharing your screen. All right. This is theoretically going to share my screen. We'll go here, and let's see if this works. All right. I will take feedback now. Is everybody seeing what uh, they might expect to see? No. Hi, is that you? ac 7 pb Okay, we looking okay. I don't want to start if, if we're not okay. Is that good, Paul? Good, good. Uh, well, you should go to the, um, right now we're looking at not the slideshow, we're looking at the it's slide. just TV, I think it's uh, that's, that's okay. I'm just going to click down one at a time and, and go through it. Okay, because I can see the slides on the left side as well as your stuff on the right side. Oh, oh, all right. Okay, well, I want to describe first the, uh, uh, SDR hardware setup and uh, what my RF setup is like so we know uh, what the starting conditions are for all these comparisons. Uh, this is a five element LFA on the tower. It's up uh, about uh, 60 feet. It's fed with uh, 80 feet of uh, half inch hard line. Uh, that comes down into an ARR gas fit preamp and that feeds the TS590 SG, which has a shared output. Uh, so one output goes to the SDR and the other output feeds the 590 itself. Uh, the Air Spy uh, R2 is next, and uh, then the SDR uh, C console 3.x software controls it. Uh, a quick note the split output from the TS590 SG comes after the gas vent preamp. And that's really important because. Your system sensitivity is set by the first RF amplifier that is seen after the antenna. And if you put a splitter in and then a preamp, your splitter uh, destroys the noise uh, figure, the sensitivity of the preamp by the amount of loss in the splitter. And a two-way splitter has approximately 2.7 or 3 dB loss. So you spend all this money, maybe over $100, to buy a 0.5 dB gas fit preamp and you put a 3 dB loss in front of it and that turns it into a 3.5 dB noise figure preamp, which is a waste of your money. So it's important to do the splitting after the preamp. Uh, and in mine, I did that because I have a uh, gas fit preamp that can be switched in and out. So it, uh, it has RF switching built into it. Okay, so that takes care of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the groundwork, as it were. Uh, the software we're talking about using is by Simon, uh, and it's called SDR Console. And I'm using the setup for uh, an R2. And what I'd like to talk, this is the basic screen layout that we're looking at you, that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, I would point out a, a, a couple of things right off the bat. I have markers all across here, as you can see, 260 MSK, uh, 275 30A, uh, FT8, and that uh, those are all the frequencies that I have marked in the software. So when I look at the spread, I can tell what's going on uh, across different uh, frequencies and different modes. This is just a receiver. It doesn't care what mode we're using. The... Um, uh, these peaks you see here, 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 and here, those are all Wi-Fi spikes. That is, they are land spikes, they're interference that I cannot control. Uh, and fortunately, none of them fall directly on top of one of our favorite operating frequencies. This right here, which a lot of people have seen on their setups, this is what I call my roving mini Moby hump. It's an interfering signal. It slides up and down the band. Mine actually moves every time I transmit. 
uh, and it will sometimes slide right through my operating frequency. We believe it's being caused by uh, uh, some sort of a charging device uh, in my house because I don't have any near neighbors. Uh, and it is uh, a pain to deal with, but I am not the only person to report this kind of a problem. So if you see it, chances are, unless you have real close neighbors, you're gonna find it in your own house. And it could be just about anything that uses a wall ward or something like that. That aside, uh, the basic layout uh, we're talking about up here is the, uh, uh, this is the mode setup. Obviously, upper sideband is normal. And then uh, right here, we have WSJT as a named filter. I created that filter myself uh, because I wanted a filter that matched what was in the uh, TS590SG so we could make valid comparisons. So that filter is set to, uh, uh, I believe it's one, let me look over here, 150 to... Uh, yeah, 150 to 3500 hertz wide. And that I call that my WSJTX filter. Uh, as far as the settings that we're gonna use for the uh, R2, and this is where we get into, I think some of the important stuff. These are the settings that work. In other words, I'm not gonna go through and say, well, we'll change this, we'll do this, we'll do that. I'm, I'm gonna show you this and say, if you have an R2, these are the settings you want to work, want to use, and they'll work. And an important distinction to start off with is the assumption is that you will have a good preamp in front of the R2. We're not using the internal uh, preamp or LNA that is built into the R2. Anybody who's going to do serious work is going to want a preamp in front of that uh, receiver, whether it's a, an R2 or a fun cube or a, uh, 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 what's the other one called? Uh, play, SDR play. Uh, you're gonna, you want to put a, your preamp in front of it because you, the noise figure of your preamp, external preamp is going to be better than the noise figure that's built into the LNAs that are part of these dongles. You don't want to run them both, but you, want to, but you definitely want to turn the internal one off or very low gain and turn the external one on and let it do the heavy lifting, you'll be much ahead. So let's look at the, uh, the settings. If you look over here, uh, let's see, Paul, you did a nice job of annotating this. There it is, wonderful. Um, if we look here on the left-hand side, uh, starting just under the, the bias T and data packing, which are not checked, there are two, two choices. There's linear gain or, or sensitive gain. Uh, you can use either. I preferred for six meters to use sensitive gain because interference is not a problem. Overload is not much of a problem. And the master gain setting is at 18. That doesn't mean what it looks like it means because we are going to reduce that gain down right below it. So sensitive gain, master gain, sensitive mode, 18 for the master gain. Then we drop down to LNA. This normally runs up around 19 if you don't have an, uh, an external preamp. Notice that it's been reduced to six. And that what that allows to happen is all the work, the heavy lifting is being done by the gas vet, not by what's built into the R2. Uh, the mixer gain is set at 15. The VGA gain is 17. These are just things we arrived at through experience. I can't even tell you what they mean. I just know if you don't set them there, it won't work as well. Uh, visual gain minus 30, that's so it, uh, it, it sits on the display of the uh, SDR software without going up through the top or going down through the bottom. It's just a, a visual adjustment. Uh, AGC, notice that it's set to off. You will get, you will get maximum sensitivity and uh, maximum SNR, although again, let's not fall in love with SNR, uh, by running AGC off and simultaneously setting the gain at 75 dB. You can play with that. You can take it to 80, you can take it to 70. Wh whatever produces the kind of thermometer indication on WSJTX that you're looking for. Um, 
for MSK and for Q65, AGC off works really well. Uh, for FT8, especially on uh, a crowded band, you might have to turn AGC fast on, just click on fast. Um, you need fast recovery, so don't use medium or slow. So sensitive, gain settings as noted, AGC off, 75 dB for the AGC gain. And then we come down to the F-frame, uh, I think that's what's his name, uh, Ephraim Mala, and that's the noise reduction. Uh, set, turn it on, NR1, just click on NR1, and set it to 5 dB, no more. If you become aggressive with that, you'll lose decodes. Uh, yes. Before you leave this screen, before yes. you leave this page, I have a comment, So, but go ahead. No, go ahead, I'll wait. Um, just you might want to show with your pointer where the slider is that moves these things up and down this whole window. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, gotcha. And the fact that you have to click on the little uh, triangles at the right to expand these various sections. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, to move up and down the uh, various choices, there's a slider right here, right? And you can slide up to the top and it'll show the frequency and the IF filter settings, and you can slide all the way to the bottom and see some of the other settings. As far as changing the values, the sliders are horizontal uh, right here, here. And, and the other thing that uh, Rick mentioned is these little caret marks just above the, uh, my cursor, each one of them uh, will make those settings either appear or disappear. So it can be very confusing. You can look you confusing. You can look at the screen and say, well, my screen doesn't have those choices. They're there, but they're hidden. You have to click on the little carrot, little arrows uh, to, uh, to get at them. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the settings. Uh, in general, DSP noise reduction, that NR1, is a bad idea for digital work. Surprisingly, extensive testing has shown that this particular noise reducer if kept at 5 dB or less, actually improves decoding and SNR for all digital modes, uh, MSK144, Q65, and FT8. Uh, note, there is a noise blanker in here. Don't use it. It should never be turned on. Uh, it is not as effective as the wideband noise blanker, which should be used and is located in a different menu. And it is extremely effective. Uh, it is uh, hard to believe how well it does. Okay. At the very top, if we had slid the, the, the uh, scroll up, you'll see that the, the WSJTX filter is, which I created, is labeled there. Uh, USB is selected there. And up here is your audio device. And I'm using a virtual audio cable, uh, VAC, uh, line one as my audio output device, and that feeds uh, WSJTX. Up above, of course, is the frequency, and then in the top right, you see the, the definition of the filter. So this filter, WSJTX, produces that passband, and I created that filter and told it, use this as a filter. Uh, it's a very handy feature. Um, and, ha and Hassan, you get yes. to the create by clicking on the three dots. Oh, excuse me. Very good point. Uh, if you look uh, right here, there are three dots there. If you click on that, it'll take you into a, a sub menu that's very nicely laid out where you can tell it uh, center frequency, low, high, any way you want to do it. You pick the filter and you can name it any, can, any name you're comfortable with. Uh, don't get too verbose or it won't fit. Uh, and then once you do that, it'll appear in your uh, in your uh, menu structure here in the the uh, under filter. It's very handy. Okay. Uh, also notice this is important. Uh, the audio level, the audio slider right here, that determines the audio level that you will feed to WSJTX, and that will control the thermometer that you've got in WSJTX, showing the level. Now, two things work together here. This audio level 
and the AGC setting. If you set your AGC setting to off, then the slider underneath that sets the sensitivity in AGC will influence the output level to WSJTX just as much as this will. And so you can get really confused if you click on uh, AGC off and that slider that we played with, where was it? It was up uh, here. If this slider is set too low, there'll be no output that WSJTX can see. And you'll say, well, how come I don't have any signal? Where, where's the signal? Well, it's being masked by this low setting here of uh, AGC levels. If it's set to fast, that doesn't happen. It'll jump way up and be normal. But when you set it to off, you must custom set this level and then play with, uh, play with the audio output level to produce the thermometer in WSJTX of, uh, they say 30 dB. I actually run closer to 40 and 50 dB without any trouble at all. Okay. Now we're on to the, the magic noise blanker. Uh, this hey, can is. I, can I ask? A, can I put sure. a quick point in? Yeah. Um, back on the uh, on the VAC, um, what I did for the uh, virtual audio cable, um, I upgraded it to the ver uh, version 4.65, which is available online for uh -huh. dollars, and it improved my audio considerably. Uh, so uh, I just cool. Let you know about that. And the results with, uh, with VAC have been um, uh, a bit erratic. Some people have upgraded to the newest versions and had trouble. Other people have gone back and used older versions and they're fine. So it's a little bit all over the map. There may not be just one solution. Uh, note what Paul said and uh, uh, play with it as you need. I've also used VB audio for some time. But I got an up, a Windows update one time, and it caused VB audio to stop working. So I went over to uh, VAC, and uh, I've been using that ever since, and it's it's worked out well. Let's see if we can locate on our uh, pictures here. Um, While he's yes. looking, Paul, you said you have four dot six what? Uh, 4.65, I believe, is the latest version um, that you can get online. I had 4.14 before, and uh, sometimes uh, I found out that the when I put SDRC on, that the audio level into WSJT was was really really low. And then if I restarted it, it would work. But by going to this new version of uh, 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 the uh, virtual VAC. It, it, it works a lot better now. And it, okay. I don't have any more audio problems. Cool. All right. Uh, I want to go back because we're going to explain a little bit about the uh, the wideband uh, DSP noise blanker. This is the magic one, the one that actually works right. Uh, you will find that in the main menu, if you hit uh, a home, it will, it will show you this lay layout where you've got a start radio, stop radio, uh, some other settings. And then over on the right-hand side, it'll say noise blanker, wideband DSP noise blanker. This is the one that we're going to use uh, to fight impulse noise. And uh, if you have power line noise, this will do a remarkable job. And at the same time, not only does it suppress the noise, it does not destroy the decoding capabilities. In fact, it enhances it. I can, I can point my antenna at my noise source, which is on a power pole, and have the 590 and the SDR running in parallel. And I'm pointed at 60 degrees, uh, which is uh, where I point to work New England. And I'll get no decodes at all on the 590SG. And I'll get decodes like crazy on the SDRC as long as I've turned enable and properly set the noise blanker up. And we're going to discuss now how you do that. All right. If you click on the noise blanker options uh, on that full screen uh, over on the right-hand side where it says enable, one of the other choices is uh, options. 
you click on options and this screen comes up. And up here, of course, you see the check mark for enable. And here you see threshold, and this is going to be critical to adjust this. Over here, you have advanced controls that you can change. Don't touch them. <laughs> you don't need to. It works very, very well without playing around. If you get bored someday and just have to find something to play with, play with them, but return them to where, uh, where the default settings are. Uh, the threshold determines at what level it will start blanking. And the lower you move the threshold, the harder it blanks. So as you go down in threshold, you go up in blanking. And, the, and notice that this is set to 3.0. And what I did, or, and I, as I learned how to use it, is just start anywhere. And you'll notice your blanking is sitting down at zero. And you move it down a little, a little more, a little more, a little more. Keep moving it down. And all of a sudden, it'll start blanking. And at this point, you can see I'm blanking at 36%. If you read the manual or the, the help files, it'll tell you that's way too much. Well, what we've discovered is uh, the manual wasn't written for digital. 36% uh, is easily handled by digital, and it will lower your noise floor anywhere from 7 to 10 dB, uh, which makes a ginormous difference if you're trying to copy weak signals. So... I've let it go as high as 60% and still had a uh, very good decoding, but typically I try to run it so it's around 30% if I'm pointed at a noise source. Uh, noise blanking is extremely effective on MSK144 and on Q65. On FT8, if you get too aggressive in noise blanking, you will get multiple decodes They'll get a whole series of decodes from the same station. Uh, and it has led people in the past to say, oh, this guy's got a bad signal. Look at all those images because he's overdriving his radio. Well, that's not what's happening. Uh, you, you are distorting the input signal with your noise blanker. So be careful before you uh, jump to a conclusion about somebody else's signal. Always look at the noise blanker. And if you have any questions at all, turn it off. If you turn it off and the multiples go away, problems on your end, not, not on, on their end. Uh, this is, I cannot emphasize enough how good this noise blanker is with pulse noise. Now, if your noise is just white hash, is just a very hashy, not pulsy uh, background, it's not nearly as effective. And you can find that when you, in, when you lower the threshold enough to get any kind of blanking, you're also blanking the signal. So uh, it's very good for pulse noise, but not so much for, for other uh, types of noise. Uh, what we're gonna cover now is uh, uh, not just about SDRs, it's about your radio or receivers in general. Uh, and we're gonna talk about how you optimize uh, and can verify that your receiver is working uh, properly. Uh, how is sensitivity practically determined from an RF perspective? Two, two things, your receiver's internal noise floor, the noise temperature, the noise created by all of the electrons running around inside your receiver, uh, and B, your immediate local environment, your ambient noise level. What is the noise like in the near environment of my antenna? How to measure your receive performance without instruments. This requires no test equipment. Uh, a crude test, uh, VHF with directional antennas. One, set your RF gain to maximum, your AGC off if possible, otherwise fast. 1A, point your antenna at the quietest direction in terms of noise. In other words, you've already been using your antenna. Move your antenna until your noise level is the lowest that you can find. At this point, disconnect your antenna and connect a 50 ohm resistor, a dummy load. If you don't have one, uh, I would suggest everybody buy these little BNC terminators that are 50 ohms. They cost 25, 50 cents uh, and buy an adapter that goes from BNC to UHF and use that. Until you do that, 
you can do the same test. It's not as accurate, but you can do the same test just by leaving the antenna open circuited. So disconnect the antenna, connect a 50 ohm load. Turn your audio volume up to a moderately loud level. And I don't mean shake you out of the shack. I mean, just set it so it's clear what that level sounds like to you. Because you, you turn your ear to it and say, ah, I know the level. All right. So I said, note this level with your ear meter. Now, disconnect the 50 ohm load and connect your antenna while paying attention to the noise. The moment you connect the antenna, did your audio noise level jump up significantly? Was it very obviously louder? And you can connect, reconnect, connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect, and just listen to it. You should be able to hear it. Now, a trick you can use if you, if you want to, you could actually connect an AC voltmeter to your headphone jack or speaker and watch the signal go up and down, the noise go up and down because it is an AC signal. Uh, if yes, if the noise gets obviously louder when you connect your antenna, your local ambient noise is louder than the internally generated noise in your radio. In one way, that's a very good thing because if it doesn't, it's very bad. If no, it's bad news. If your external noise from the antenna does not overwhelm the internal noise of your radio, this would mean your received front end is very, very poor. Uh, on the other hand, if the externally generated noise is 15 dB louder than your 50 ohm resistor, that is also bad noise. It means that your ambient noise environment is terrible in that direction and will make receiving signals, weak signals, very difficult. So you don't want to see more than maybe two, three, four dB jump in noise when you connect your antenna. If it's 10 or 15 dB, you're hearing an awful lot of noise that doesn't belong there. Um, a solution, uh, very superior noise blanker, which we've talked a little bit about, or find the noise source, uh, what it is, and fix it. Uh, or, as I do, don't bother pointing that way. Um, I've got, a, like I said, a 15 to 17 dB noise at a bearing of uh, uh, anywhere from 60 to uh, 100 degrees. I'll move my antenna to 50 and put the noise down the slope of the, the antenna. I'll move the antenna to 130 and put the noise slope down the antenna. And the pattern of the antenna is broad enough that there's no real loss in signal strength, but I have reduced the noise. Uh, let's see. All right, option two. So now we have a sim we had a simple test for, uh, is my receiver good enough to hear the outside noise? Uh, a more precise test uh, using a preamp, but still not any test equipment is one, turn your radio, tune your radio in FM mode to a local FM repeater. One that's busy, hopefully. Uh, turn your preamp off. Turn your antenna away from the signal source so that there is a significant amount of background noise. In other words, kill some of the quieting. The goal in FM is to have a fully quieting signal. We're going to use that, and we're going to say, I don't want a fully quieting signal. I want a signal that, that is a little noisy. Not awful, but enough that the noise is obvious. And once you set that and you can hear noise on the FM signal, then turn the preamp on. So your preamp is off. You've deliberately reduced the signal. And now you can turn the preamp on and see what happens. Did the quieting get better? In other words, when you turned that preamp on, did it go from shh to quiet? Did the quieting get better? Did the noise on the FM signal decrease when you turned the preamp on? If so, the preamp is improving your system sensitivity. If it did not, then your local noise is so strong in the direction you are pointing that the preamp is being overwhelmed by your local noise and your preamp is useless. Find the noise and fix it or point in another direction. Uh, if you measure the decrease in audio noise with an AC voltmeter when the preamp is turned on, this is a rough indication of how many dB your received sensitivity has improved due to the preamp. So we didn't need any test equipment and we were able to determine, uh, is my preamp helping me or not? 
Uh, the problem most people run into is they listen on single sideband, they turn on the preamp, and they hear this gigantic increase in noise, but they have no idea how that's affecting the actual sensitivity. If you use this FM trick, the quieting that's produced ignores the noise and only shows you the effect of the RF. It's a cute little trick. Since we're many concerned with decoding using our SDRs, there is a proven method of evaluating any station changes that does not rely on test equipment, yet is quite accurate, leaving nothing to opinion or interpretation. Uh, this methodology was developed specifically for evaluating system changes with SDRs, but it will easily apply to any system where the evaluation tool is WSJTX and modes, and the modes are MSK144. Q65 or FT8 and FT4 and some others. The initial testing approach was developed by Paul into EME and evaluated with weeks and months of testing by N0AN, much of it done with uh, KB7IJ. All right. Set your system up to receive, for example, FT8 on HF, for example, on 20 meters. Control all your variables, that is, determine how you're going to set up AGC on or off, your volume level, your noise blanking settings, your RF gain, etc. Get a baseline of how my controls are set, and then don't touch them. When the band is busy, let WSJTX decode, and note the number of decodes per sequence. And if you look at WSJTX down at the bottom of each uh, uh, at the end of each cycle, it'll tell you how many decodes there were. It'll do it for you. You don't have to count them. Uh, establish a baseline of decodes per sequence. This will take some time, a few minutes perhaps, and the number of decodes per sequence will differ by even or odd. So you have to kind of get a feel for how many decodes am I seeing. Uh, once you're confident that you have a relatively stable measure of the number of decodes per sequence, then begin by making one change in your configuration at a time. For example, noise blanking level or noise blanking on or off, RF gain higher or lower, AGC on, AGC off. Then simply take another run of decodes with the single change you made and which setting of the two produced the greater number of decodes per sequence. The beauty of this is that it is measuring the real world use of your radio. Why are we running the software? We want decodes. More decodes is always better. Any, cha any change we make that improves the number of decodes per sequence is a positive change. So we don't need a bunch of fancy equipment. What we have to do is just let the software count the number of decodes for us. Now, if you have a side-by-side -side setup where you have a radio here and an SDR here, running off a split antenna like my system is, then you can literally watch the difference between the 590SG and the SDR in real time. So at the end of a sequence, you just look and say, ah, it got eight decodes, this got four. Hmm, let's watch some more sequences. And when you watch it over time, you can eventually see, well, the SDR is outperforming the uh, TS590SG. Uh, it's harder to do without a second radio, but you can still do it. The best way of doing this is to have two setups, one for your SDR and one for a different radio. In my case, since the antenna was being fed to the TS590SG and split to the SDR, I could make direct comparisons of the 590's decoding efficiency versus the SDR's decoding efficiency. Any changes would show up the very first sequence and all sequences thereafter. Whichever setup, SDR or radio, produced the greater number of decodes on the same sequence was the superior setup. So you can see how we uh, actually arrived at uh, the settings that I listed above. We went through and changed each one of those settings over and over and over and over again until we found the ideal setting and even interactions of settings that would produce the greatest number of decodes per sequence. All right, the t and this is what we found out. The TS590SG is exceptionally good for digital modes. Its noise blanker is good, 
but not great. The SDR under the control of SDRC software is far, far superior to the 590SG for digital decoding if there's any significant amount of impulse noise or even mild hashy background noise. Six meter MSK144, the difference is 30 to 50%. That is, the AirSpy R2 produced 30 to 50% more decodes per sequence than the TS590SG did. At no time did the number of decodes per sequence on the 590 exceed the number of decodes on the SDR. It was always equal or worse. That is, the 590 was always equal or worse. Uh, there were times, however rare, that a decode would appear on the 590 that did not appear on the SDR. But the SDR still showed more decodes per sequence, even having missed one that the 590 caught. These same results carry over to HF using an AirSpy RSPDX SDR, but the differences are not as dramatic on FD8 as they are on MSK144. The number of decodes per sequence on FT8 were slightly in favor of the SDR much of the time, but not, a, not all of the time. And a point I would like to make uh, about managing your, your radio when you use it, especially if you're on HF, if you can turn your AGC off and then ride your RF gain control, you will get more decodes per sequence than any boxed radio that has AGC on. Uh, the authors of uh, WSJTX have made it quite clear that the maximum performance decoding will occur with AGC off. If you can do that, do it. You may have to ride your RF gain control a little bit to get it, but you will get better performance. So if you're looking for really, really, really weak signals, turn the AGC off and manage your RF gain control. Uh, for just general operating on HF, uh, AGC FAST works just dandy. Uh, the settings shown above for the AirSpy R2 are optimized. They've been shared with others who were able to duplicate these results. In other words, what I'm doing tonight is sharing those results with you. Well, I've shared this uh, screenshot of all the settings with other R2 owners and they immediately went from thinking they had a piece of junk in the R2 to saying, boy, that made a big difference. Well, that's, that's why we're doing this. Now, prior to using them, they thought the R2 was a piece of junk. Uh, the problem is there are way too many things to get right to take the unit, any SDR, out of the box and just expect to work, uh, hoping that the default settings are ideal, and they most certainly are not. Uh, establish a baseline of decoding performance and change one thing at a time and then optimize from there. And then secondly, I'm going to repeat this warning for the 10th time. The SNR reports from WSJTX mean absolutely nothing in terms of your received performance. They are misleading, they are inaccurate, and don't rely on them for making decisions about how your system is working. Only the only valid measure of received performance is raw number of decodes uh, per sequence. Hassan, would you say that's for any mode, including Q65 also? Yes. Thank yes. you. The, the, I mean, the values may tell you something, but the only thing you care about is how many decodes are you getting? I mean, are you getting decodes? Uh, the, the, the number itself can be very, very misleading. In fact, they tinker with that number all the time as they're working with the software, especially in Q65. They play around with that number all the time to get, get values that seem to reflect the real world and they're still playing with it. Uh, the, uh, I'm gonna show you some very interesting things now. I'm gonna take the, the main screen off here. Let's see, I think that will work. All right. And I want to, let's see, let me do this again. Well, my question is, what did I do with my wonderful screen share? <clears throat> 
Okay, it should be down near the bottom. Down near the bottom of your screen. All right, let me see if I can get this to go back to. Uh... Well, that didn't do it. If, you, if you're the guy that's sharing it, it'll be towards the top of the screen where it's minimized. You'll see a stop sharing button if you move your cursor towards the top of your screen. Uh, that's where I'm looking. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Aha. Stop share. I'll bring the share back in just a second. I want to get something else up here first. Okay. You did a great job, son. Yeah, all you right. notice how quiet we all are? We're glued to uh, <laughs> this information. Well, I know I'm throwing a lot at you at one time, and I apologize for it. Um, okay, let's see. Let's go here and share this and okay. Uh, is this uh, let me get rid of this. Is this screen here where I'm moving my cursor around? Is this big enough for you to uh, uh, to see see what I'm uh, kind of pointing at? I think so, but you could. Do you have like the full screen uh, up at the top right hand corner? Yeah, I'm. I'm looking for that right now. Nope, nope that's the wrong one. There. No, well, now I've got your. Yeah, that's, that's the wrong one. Yeah. I want. I want this one to be full screen. Come on, you little stinker. Uh, maybe I can move this out of the road. What I'm trying to do is get this to go full screen, and I haven't succeeded in doing it yet. Well, let me see if there's another way I can do this. Hang on just a second. Hassan, I, I have an idea of what you're trying to do, and it, it, there is enough of it there to be able to. Oh, there is? Yeah. And if if not, well, we can have. Well, the other thing is maybe I can just find the uh, that window by itself. There it is. That'll do it. Now I think it'll work. All right. This is an MP4 recording of an actual uh, Q65 contact with uh, KB7IJ, and I'm going to sh uh, show a few others. Uh, the point I was uh, uh, about to make in the, the uh, description was every digital signal uh, that's burst mode, like uh, MSK144, Q65, um, every one of those that's burst mode has a, a signature. And that signature is a function of what propagation mode is taking place. Are we seeing a meteor burst? Are we seeing uh, ionoscatter? Are we seeing troposcatter? Are we seeing uh, sporadic E? Are we seeing tropospheric ducting? Are we seeing airplane scatter? Each one of those has a signature that you can actually see with your SDR if you turn on signal history. And what I'm gonna show you over the next several minutes is the signal history of some contacts and the different propagation modes that are taking place. One of the advantages, uh, and I talked about this a little bit when I did the Q65 demonstration. When we run FT8, it is optimized for FT8. When we run MSK144, it is optimized for MSK144. If the pro it's, it's made for bursts. Q65 is not optimized by propagation mode. It will use whatever propagation is happening at the time. So if there's a meteor ping, 
good chance to decode. If there's ionoscatter, it'll decode it. If there's a sporadic E, it'll decode it. It doesn't care. Well, we're going to watch this happen uh, in real time. Essen? Yes. Uh, the, just this is a f recording and playback is a function of, uh, well, the recording is something that SDR console has Does. built into it. Yes. It has, it has a recording functionality built into it to do this. Yes, it's got a, a it's got a beautiful MP4, which is standard to all computer platforms, all um, operating systems, including telephones, support MP4 recordings. So I can just tell it to record and it will record it so I can play it back and decode it all over again. Or I can record it and play it back so you can see the signal levels up here. Or I can record it and playing back so you can see the instantaneous signature of any given signal, which is absolutely invaluable if you're trying to evaluate how is this signal being propagated. Is it, is it happening because of a meteor ping? Is it happening because of tropo scatter, tropo ducting, airplane scatter? What's causing this? Well, they all have a unique signature, and we'll see some of them. All right. This is a, a ping. You can see a rapid rise and a little bit of a decay over time. This is not a meteor ping. This is a different uh, signature, a, uh, uh, a different burst mode. And uh, these are all 15 seconds long. You can see the noise floor down here is minus 122. That's me transmitting, so it mutes the uh, signal. It just turned back on. There's minus 122, which is my noise floor. There's a burst of minus 106. That is a classic meteor ping. Immediate, sharp rise, decay over time and what KB7IJ calls an aftershock. Another meteor ping, vertical rise, taper down, right? Vertical rise, taper down. The, this at the end here, that's a transient going from receive to transmit, it can be ignored. This is me transmitting and so if my receiver is muted. And I think we stopped. No, we didn't. Okay, here we go. Again. Now that is not a meteor. That is either sporadic E. That's a meteor, right? So on top of this, which was not a meteor, was this. That's the end of the transmission, his transmission. And he was running about uh, 50 watts at a distance of 667 miles on six meters. <clears throat> Actually, we don't have to sit and wait. I can move this ahead. Duh. Okay, baseline minus 122. There's a minor ping, just five or six dB out of the noise right there. He is now running 10 watts output. And there's a ping that's easily 10 to 15 dB out of the noise with him running 10 watts at a difference, a distance of 670 miles. That, by the way, just, just the little bit that was here, I will show you, let's look at the whole, the whole thing. Just that little bit of information, as weak as it was, produced a perfect decode. Again, noise floor, minus 122, that's 16 dB out of the noise. Meteor ping, fast rise, 
slope down. Fast rise, slope down. Fast rise, slope down. And this is all, again, with 10 watts output. So every little reflection of whatever source that is taking place between the two stations shows up on this graph. Uh, signal history in MSK we are in uh, SDRC is a wonderful tool. All right, let's uh, stop this one. Let me go uh, here. And uh, bring up the next one. Are you guys seeing the new one okay? Okay. Yep. Uh, you notice that this one, this particular signal, was not meteor at all, straight up and straight down. So that means it's a different mode of scatter. And in this particular example, this is K, K5 uh, GZR, and I managed to get the whole graph centered on the picture. So you're not looking at half a graph, you're seeing the entire, uh, the entire sequences. All right, there's the start of the sequence. And uh, Rick, how much power were you running here? A hundred and some watts, was it? Right, a uh, hundred and twenty, not, not much more than that, if, if any. Right, and that's eight, 120. 850 miles with a hundred watts output on six meters. Notice this super straight, fast edge, first edge slope down. That is the classic uh, over dense meteor burn. Again, straight up, slope down, and a mild aftershock. And this is a 15 second or we well, are raging 30B. That might be 30 seconds long, I believe. While we're waiting, this is an this is a recording of of what was seen on the screen. Um, you can also record the IQ and replay it. Yes, this is and, an MP4. And display, the, and display the same thing in some other way if you want to. The same received signal and, and display it some other way. Yes, the IQ Different. recording is more powerful, but it takes more processing time. Uh, the MP4 recording uh, is easily shared among people and doesn't require any SDRs, which is a, a big advantage. So I could share it with you. Uh, let's see here. And uh, each one of these uh, 15 second or 30 second series uh, produced perfect decodes every time. We never missed a decode. And that's 100 watts during a non band opening at uh, 850 miles. And you can see every little tiny grain of sand that might be up there that is uh, producing information. And Q65 combines all those little things and produces decodes out of it. You can't do that with other modes. That's why I'm such a big fan of Q65. All right, let's see if I can bring up uh, another example here. This is WB4HIE on the East Coast. Uh, I'm pointing in my noise direction. Notice that the noise floor says minus 117 instead of minus 123. Because I'm pointed into the noise. There, minus 117 is my baseline noise level when pointed at 125 degrees instead of pointed south at Rich and uh, Rick.
That's a signal there. That's a signal. That's a signal. That's a signal. That's a signal. None of those are <clears throat> strong enough to produce a decode in other modes. And then there's a monster. Hassan, can you yes. pause it and go back to that peak? Sure. Which, where, you know, where, where the big peak is right at the net. Well, yeah. There you mean? That peak, but put it so that it's showing on the uh, meters at the top. In other words, move it so it's at the very right edge. Oh, as it'll just right come there. on. Yeah, right, right there. And you can watch the uh, the S meter at the top and see. Oh, see it bounce, yes. Yeah, and so what's showing on the history graph, you can All right, compare there. that. There you go. Yeah, what you're seeing there is the, the, the uh, SDR uh, C signal history in real time bounces up and down according to the level of the signals. For example, since we know that my noise level is at this point uh, minus 117, we can see that that peak is 98. So that means that that peak of that signal is 19 dB out of the noise for over a second, which is easily decodable. Uh, these other ones are much shorter and they can be decoded when they're added together using the averaging approach. Oh, go, hold on. Look up in the in the uh, spectrum display where the meter is. Yes. Yes. You can see those same. There's my meter showing minus ninety eight point two. This is the pass band we're listening to. And this is the baseline noise. And this is the signal inside the pass band showing that peak. And notice it says two thirty five. Uh, 120E, it's actually 30B is what we're using, because I have markers for each one of the modes, so I can see what's going on if I'm not uh, on that particular frequency or mode at the time. Thank you. You bet. All righty. And the gray line down here is the average noise floor. Now, I would also make the point that you, these little pings you're seeing here are, are not decodable. And oftentimes, you can't hear them. And only if your eye is really good can you see them as little dots on the uh, uh, waterfall. But they still decoded perfectly. All right, let's do this last one. This is mode 120E, which is two, eh, two minutes long. And I'm now changing the time base so we can see a lot better. So we're going along here and we're not seeing a thing. The noise level is minus 116. There's just no signal there. The distance station is in North Carolina and it's running 75 watts on a non-open band. Well, look at that. Out of the blue, nowhere. We have a little tiny ping there, a little tiny ping there, a little tiny ping there, a big one there. This hole is caused by my two meter APRS overloading my receive preamp. There's another ping, another hole, and another ping. So that's all the information that was available in that two minute period, just these little tiny things. It decoded at a level of minus 15. The threshold for decoding in uh, 120E is about minus 35. So we had a 20 dB margin to work with, with just that little bit of signal showing up. That's the end of that. A is more sensitive than E, right? 
No, 120E is more 120E is more sensitive than 120A for terrestrial work. Moon bounce different matter, but right. uh, purely by experimental, 120E is very very wide. It's it's you know like that wide. 120A is like that. For some reason, it appears that the width allows the buckets to fill up with smaller signals more easily for terrestrial work. Nobody knows why. Joe doesn't even know why. All we know is that when we compared 120A to 120C to 120E, we got more decodes per uh, more decodes on 120E than we did in the other two modes. But for moon bounce, they run 120 alpha, and I've used it, and it does work. I actually made an, an EME contact with my five element array. Okay, and here we go again. Notice there's just nothing happening. This is, it's a difficult path with no band opening and um, 800 some miles to the East Coast from Iowa. But look here, tiny little ping there, tiny little ping there. Those are barely 5 dB out of the noise. And you could not hear them. They were too weak. And keep in mind, this entire sequence was two minutes long. That produced a minus 21 decode, even though there was almost no information available at all. And uh, comparing... Tw uh... 20, or excuse me, 120A, so on, the, the various um, time, the various lengths of um, sequences and the amount of space that's used in the spectrum. Um, the recommendation was what, 30A? 30A. 30A because it provides almost as much as for instance 30b but uh, of course takes half as much bandwidth. exactly and I, what i would tell most people is i would recommend them running 30b instead of 120e except in the most extreme uh, circumstances because it uses uh one fourth of the time and much less spectrum and produce still produces much better decodes than than 30A. I don't want to get us distracted, uh, but this is just an example of what the, the software can do. The signal history is potentially very, uh, very valuable. Uh, I turned off screen sharing. Let me get rid of this and go back to this. And I think that's it. All right. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, let me go back to uh, screen sharing again. Okay, and we'll take that and share. All right, uh, this just re uh, reiterates the point that uh, you can look at the graphs and tell what the propagation mode is. This is a classic meteor ping. This is not. Notice straight edge up, straight edge down. Meteors don't usually look like that. They almost all have this characteristic fade. And we don't know what mode this is. This spike that appears that's straight up and down. We're still speculating on what that is, but we do see them fairly frequently. But meteors don't look quite like that. Okay, that's basically all the information I had. Uh, I'm going to turn off this, the uh, screen share, and uh, we'll be back to just normal stuff. And if you guys have questions or uh, comments or anything, uh, I apologize for it being a bit disjointed, but it was an awful lot of information to try to cover in a short time. I saw it on those, uh, on those uh, spikes at the very last that you were showing. I get those occasionally too, and I think it's just a quick meteor bounce. I think is what it is. Yeah, it could be a, a under dense meteor where there is no extended burn. Right, yeah. It's very interesting. It, it put it this way, I get a lot more information 
to, uh, to, to try to interpret by looking at the signal history than I do looking at a bunch of dots on the uh, waterfall. There's a lot more information available. And that's all part of SDRC, which is kind of cool. Other question? Oh, uh, David, uh, did this address your R2, your R2 questions? Schumacher, uh, or Schumacher, did that address your, I know you had some concerns about yes. getting, did this address it? I was actually on the other end of the room changing settings as you were <laughs> describing them. And the other thing that's still um, unclear to me is where I see the noise level sitting is like minus 115. And I'm sitting there going, why isn't that down at like minus 130? Well, well I'm a move that, out guy. Okay. It's all it's all based on how you how you calibrate. You can you can calibrate your uh, with the visual gain, you can calibrate your uh, baseline noise. And what Rich and I have done is we mutually agreed that we were going to put 50 ohm resistors on our antenna and we were going to set the noise level to be minus. Uh, 115 or minus 120. And once we, it was arbitrary. Once we did that, then any changes we made, we'd both be looking at the same signal level reference point. So, and we checked it to see, okay, we increased power by 3 dB. Did we see that difference? This was on satellites where they're linear. So if you doubled your power, you would actually should see a, a, an improvement in 3 dB in your SNR. Uh, and that is exactly what we, we observed. So, so we could compare apples to apples. We agreed arbitrarily to calibrate our noise level to read minus 115 or minus 120 with a 50 ohm resistor. Uh, and then we switched to our antenna and any differences that show up after that are a function of antenna gain and local ambient noise. And Rich and I see this uh, all the time Rich has got consistently 10 dB more uh, environmental noise than I do. And so he has trouble hearing me on the satellites because of that noise. And if he points toward his solar panels during the day, he can hear with diddly. Uh, so but, so I, I think the, the deal here is that you can, if you have a calibrated noise source, you can put that into the front end of your system, whatever it might be, and adjust the gain through your in various places in your system and have it be some number that you like. Yeah, you can, in other words, you can set the display gain to read anything you want. And mm -hmm. once, once you calibrate, once you decide what your calibration source is going to be, uh, it'll hold very well. It doesn't wander all over the place. It'll, it'll, it'll be good. Uh, and when I worked uh, W7GJ on EME using this, my five element array for my first and only EME contact, uh, we ran 120A and I was seeing his signal. Uh, the, uh, the, the noise floor was floating around minus 118 or so uh, pointed in that direction. If I turned around and pointed it at moonrise, I couldn't even see a signal because David, my noise levels. One of, first things, sorry, one of the first things I say to anybody when they start with SDRC is to get the whiteout out and just white out where the S meter is. <laughs> um, as long as, as long as you know what your, so you just said your S meter reading was say 110 at the moment. Okay. As long as you know, that is what your S meter normally looks like to, on when you're receiving. That is all that matters to you. I can tell you on, on that my noise figure, my, my, is minus 97 on six meters, minus 97 dBm. I don't care. That's what it is. I can make it read what I want, but without doing any settings, that's what it reads. I know every time I turn my radio on, that's what I want to see. If I see, suddenly see minus 60, I know I've got a problem. So get your, get your white out out and just cover your S meter up on your screen. It's totally- Thank you. Relevant. This is starting to make sense. So there's no correlation between the numbers on that screen and the Sherwood receiver test reports. Got correct. It. Absolutely correct. And, and, and again, keeping in mind what we're ultimately trying to do is decode. Whatever you do that produced more decodes, 
that's what's important. It doesn't matter what anything says over here. What matters is, are we getting more decodes? And the, the numbers I gave you get you in the ballpark of getting the best performance out of your system. Go ahead. Question. Will these settings apply to the RTL dongle also? No, because you won't even have the same settings uh, displayed. The, the number of settings you can control in SDRC are uh, totally dependent on which dongle you're using. The R2 has more settings available than the HF+. Plus. Uh, the uh, R2 may have some settings that the uh, HF Plus doesn't have. So you have to look at each one, uh, each unit you've got, and see what settings are available when it goes into the, the radio setup. You can see what things you can change and then play with those, but one at a time to determine the effect on decode efficiency. That's the uh, that, that makes it all scientific. It's uh, empirical. You don't have to guess. Say, yeah, I made that change and I'm getting more decodes. Oh, I'll change it even more. Oops, I'm not getting as many decodes. Maybe I should back that off. You go through that process. And if you always use as your measure the number of decodes per sequence, you'll be good. Jack, at your age, just go and buy an AR2. You don't, okay? <laughs> just go, just get an AR2 and copy his settings. Yeah, the R2 is remarkably good. And the other thing I like about it, one of the reasons I bought it, is it will accept a, uh, a Bodnar uh, GPS uh, frequency lock. And I have a dual, a dual port Bodnar, and I have one output plugged into an RSPDX, which is for HF, and the other one I have plugged into the R2. And so those are, give me two frequency standards that I can calibrate everything else to, like my 590 doesn't have that capability. So what I do is I put the SDR on, on this computer, I transmit with the 590 and make the 590 agree to the SDR because the SDR is GPS locked. Once that's set, it's, it's as good as the GPS. Any other questions? Paul is the one that talked me into the SDR, except I went to that as El Cheapo and I got the RTL rather than the R2. I have three of them, three of the RTLs. They're gathering dust. And not because they're bad. It's just that the, the R2 uh, and the RSPDX and the FunCube are all so good uh, that uh, the other ones come across as a little bit toyish. They're great for introductions and they're great to learn how to use them. But if you're really gonna make them an integral part of your station, and you're trying to maximize performance like uh, David would for EME, uh, you want a decent one. Uh, you want a good gas fed preamp in front of it. You wanna control your gain, uh, your, your gain stages as you go across. And once you do that right, it'll outperform any box radio you can get your hands on. And you want one that, uh, in general, you can lock to a st frequency standard. That would be nice, too. And the R2s will certainly do that. So you have no, capab no capability to do uh, the, the frequency lock with the Discovery or the HF Plus? Uh, no. Uh, that's no. what I thought. Yeah, because well, I threw that. And uh, I was just curious. I, I, first of all, thank you so much. This has been really great. And Paul's presentation the time before with the hardware was really good. I was just trying to sort out because I have an, uh, an SDR Play Duo and I've got the yep. Discovery Plus and I also have a dongle. Yeah, but it, it's apparent that, that from what you're saying that this R2 is the, is the cat's pajamas when it comes to uh, doing this uh, six meter and VHF. Well, it, it is quite remarkable. I will say this, though, that because WSJTX is so good, uh, in the way its uh, uh, functions are set up, that you can take your HF plus or any other SDR you've got and run it, uh, run SJTX in the freak cal mode. If you do that and you follow the instructions on, on, on how to do, to do freak cal properly, and God help you, don't try to find the, follow the instructions that come with it because they're horrid. Uh, well, once you understand how to do it, uh, I wrote a document called uh, Free Cal for Dummies. 
because I wrote it for myself. Uh, I sent out over 400 copies of it to people, and they used it to do Freak Cal on their radios using WSJTX. And every single one of them said it worked perfectly. All they had to do is do step one, step two, step three, step four. Do it exactly as listed, and it'll work. Now, the point of this is you can easily, on HF, easily get your radio calibrated less than two hertz accuracy across the entire HF spectrum because all you have to do is calibrate it to multiple WWV sources and it produces a linear regression computation and tells you what to enter into the slope and intercept in WSJTX and it'll do it automatically after you've uh, uh, done the frequency run. And then as long as you're running WSJTX, whatever it says frequency you're on, you're there within two hertz, sometimes within one. So there's some neat stuff you can do with uh, FreeCal. And so there's no reason to worry that your, your uh, HF radio is not frequency locked. You can make it as accurate as WWV within a couple hertz. Uh, and some of that is due to uh, Doppler shift during the day. Uh, on VHF, the easiest thing to do on six meters if you don't have a frequency locked device, and that's assuming it's stable in the first place, and most of them are, is to find stations that are frequency locked, like me or Larry, K0TPP, or there's a bunch of guys that have frequency locked six meter radios. Well, watch them and you will, you will see that on MSK144, they're gonna be at 1500 plus or minus Doppler. And if you watch them over time, you can tell if you're way off or not. And if you use the same calibration you started with on HF, like on a rig that covers HF and six meters, if you use that same calibration, you're going to be close and you will see that the only difference between you and them is masked by the amount of Doppler shift you're seeing due to the meteors moving. So you can get really, really close by using WSJTX's freak cal mode. Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, on, on, uh, on the... Uh, uh, SDRC, there is a bandwidth um, uh, control. Uh, the, for your... the, the zoom feature for like this? Uh, or are you talking about IF bandwidth? Uh, IF bandwidth. It's on the uh, home screen, uh, just, a, just a little over to the right. And, okay. And it says bandwidth, it's calibration and frequency. So on the bandwidth drop down. Uh, yes. You've got like a whole bunch of different frequencies. So you could you could have like three hundred and twelve point uh, five kilohertz, or you could go as high as ten megahertz. Does that make any difference in terms of uh, yes what you're co <laughs> what you're copying or yes uh, yes don't run any wider than you need to. the the wider you, the wider you go, the harder your computer has to work, and the and the more uh, you have a loss of dynamic range. There are other issues that come up when you go. In other words, if you want to see from DC to daylight as much as possible, that's fine if it's a toy. But if you want to actually get the maximum performance out of the radio, don't make it any wider than, than you need for practical purposes. A good example, on my current settings on my R2, uh, let me stop it and go back and select radio. Okay. I'm set for 312 uh, 0.5 kilohertz and that allows me to cover uh from 235 uh which is my low frequency for q65 all the way up to uh 323 and above a little bit uh for all of the modes so that it covers uh 235 q65 260 msk 275 msk 313 fd8 323 fd8 that way, I'm not asking the radio or the computer to work too hard to accomplish what it needs to accomplish. And all that's doing is giving you a picture of that moment. If you move the VFO, that 300 kilohertz goes with you. In other words, you don't need it to cover uh, uh, 50 to 54. All you need is a 300 kilohertz segment where you're at. And if that isn't wide enough, I'm not sure what you're doing. In other words, why do you need it wider than... Uh, 
a hundred times the width of a signal. It's, I don't see the function unless you're playing. If you're playing, yeah, you can do anything you want. But if you're serious, if you're trying to do EME, don't make any, make it any wider than necessary. And you, and you'll be a lot better off. Yeah. For me, I use 625 and that's the, and so the center frequency is really uh, 312 yep. uh, kilohertz. So you're looking uh, 312 either way. And that allows me to, uh, operate at least to be able to copy um, um, I can have like a window which shows me uh, a 50.125 so I can see when there's some sideband activity absolutely and it lets me go all the way up to uh, uh, 313 or 323 if I want right I still copy those in other windows so yeah the ability to simultaneously see all these signals uh, is is really something I mean I it I said to some people, I worked satellites for many years, uh, and I've said to people, running satellites without an SDR is, is like running blind. You can't see what's going on. Whereas with satellites, if you have the panoramic display up, you can see every signal from the CW beacon down here all the way up to the end of the passband up here, and you can see everything in between. You can see the CW signal beacon bouncing up and hitting minus 74 dBm. You can see a signal higher up in the band hitting minus 60, 14 dB above the beacon. That guy's breaking the rules and he's ruining it for everybody. I use the MP4 recorder to record that guy's signal and I email him the file and say, here, this is what you are doing on the satellite. You're supposed to have a signal no greater, no louder than the, the beacon. You're 14 dB above the beacon and you're stealing all the power from the rest of the operators in the passband, and that's not good operating practice. And I've sent people that before, uh, and I have never gotten a negative response. They've been amazed. They said, I didn't realize I was doing that. I'm only running 10 watts. Well, it doesn't matter what power you're running. What matters is what effect are you having on the satellite, right? The key is what's happening, not what you think is happening. And I come back to this, again, empirical measures. How's it decoding? How many decodes are we getting? It doesn't matter what you think is happening. I, I hear people say, oh, my noise level isn't bad at all. I run a signal analysis on their station, and I've worked them 200 times. Their signal reports to me are always 13 dB worse than mine to them. What does that tell you? Their noise floor is 13 dB higher than mine. Their noise floor is terrible compared to mine. So, and I'm not doing that to you know, put anybody down or make fun of them. I'm just saying, you don't know where you stand if you don't know where you stand. And you can't tell without trying to measure it. And these SDRs are a wonderful measuring tool. You can do amazing things with them. And WSJTX can do amazing things. There are tools written for it that will allow you to take every person you've ever worked and their signal report to you and average it by band. Very good. And astounding. That's, that's great. Any other any other questions for Hassan before we uh, uh, shut things down? Do you recommend we use the flatten option in WSJTX with the AirSpy R2? That's just that's purely a uh, personal preference. Uh, flatten is easier. What I prefer to do is use the um, uh, reference capability uh go ahead and follow the instructions for doing a reference sample and use that it's a little cleaner none of that has any impact at all on your received signal it's strictly a display thing but i i liked doing the reference thing one because it was fun to play with it to see what my audio passband shape really was and two i found it then it was easier to adjust and then uh sometime if you have the opportunity check in with uh kb7ij um, he taught me a, a, a very interesting technique for setting up the waterfall so you get the best contrast on the waterfall without mucking up the, uh, the appearance. Uh, you can join us anytime. We are on every single morning on uh, Chatango or Chattango uh, uh, on a, a room called Morning Mayhem. So <laughs> one word morning mayhem and there's a bunch of us 
that would do Q65, FD8, MS60, MSK1, uh, 144 uh, satellites, all sorts of testing uh, is done in that room. And plus we chat with each other. Well, if you, if any of you show up there, you're more than welcome. And uh, he can explain to you how he did, because I can never keep it straight in my head, how he set it up but it produces the best looking waterfalls that I've ever seen. Now, I, I like the signal history when using an SDR, but on my 590, I don't have that capability. So I learned how to set up the, uh, the contrast and the sensitivity, which would be the zero level and the uh, uh, gain uh, in the waterfall to produce the best looking results. That's another trick you can play with, with uh, uh, WSJTX that produces really nice uh, effects. Any other questions? Thank you. This one, um, because I know nothing on the subject. Uh, if if somebody wants to do a talk on S, this is you or Rich or Rick or uh, a talk on SDR console and satellites, that's pretty interesting. I've watched you guys do that and watch the signals going down the screen. And even somebody who doesn't do satellites is impressed. And the other thing is. Uh, I'm looking over David's shoulder, and I can see a copy of the uh, VHF UHF DX book on his shelf. That is a great. It, it's available online uh, to, for free these days. That's a great book to read. So anyway, just I noticed on the shelf over your shoulder. But if somebody can do uh, a satellite, an SDR console, because even as somebody who doesn't do satellites, I'm amazed at that. It is quite a wonder. It. Uh... I don't want to volunteer right away because I'm tired. <laughs> but the uh, uh, I do a lot of satellite work with it, and it is quite remarkable, especially on linear satellites. It's the the features that are built into it is an opens up another entire world of uh, capability that we're that we're not used to. The, suffice it to say, I have I have the software set up so I can simultaneously uh, decode four different telemetry satellites and not have to touch the radio. I don't even have to be home. It will change frequency, lock onto the frequency, the decoders running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, four different decoders running at the same time uh, and controlling the antenna. And I don't even have to be here. And all that telemetry is automatically gathered and automatically uploaded to AMSAT or AMSAT UK. Uh, all done automatically. Not a single operator uh, intervention is required. I could sit here and talk to you and have it decoding all, all that uh, information from the satellites, all because of the way Simon has written that program. It is absolutely astounding. Hassan, do you use your directional antenna for that or do you use yes, your I, um, I, okay. I, I use my elevated 15 degree elevated vertical dual band Yagi interlaced and uh, it tracks the satellite. I don't need to change the elevation because if your antenna doesn't have more than 10 dB gain or so, you don't need the elevation track. It just skew it up 15 degrees and it'll cover every elevation angle that you have. Because these are low earth orbit satellites, they're strong. It would not work for a high elliptical orbit satellite, but we haven't had those in a long time. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. I appreciate your time uh, putting all this together, Hassan and Paul, for doing the uh, hardware side, which is great. Um, I'm going to put this onto the uh, onto uh, YouTube uh, tomorrow, and uh, you guys can uh, review it again. I'll also post the uh, the slides uh, in a PDF format on the um, uh, on the uh, group IO. Uh, board as well. So you guys can go back and look at these slides individually if you like. Well, I hope it was presented in a way that you could at least uh, get a grip on what we were trying to do. That was an awful lot of information. Well, I learned something and I've been using it for a long time. So <laughs> <laughs> good deal. Thanks, guys. All right. Guys. Thank you so much, Hassan. My pleasure. Yeah, nice if you guys you have any that. ideas on, on, uh, on, on new topics, uh, just send me an email. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Thank seven, you, three, guys. Seven, three, eight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,